Om Shanti. Good morning, everyone. Happy Satguru Va. And this is an auspicious day. And also, many centers today offered book for Didi Manmohini, which I think is also very auspicious for the opening of our churning and writing retreat today. As you might know, this all was a quite short uh, notice event, and we are very overwhelmed of having more than 400 re registrations and wonderful um, spirit resources who wholeheartedly agreed to support the retreat by giving us some inspirations on how they churned and write about Baba's Gyan, about spiritual wisdom. And this is the whole purpose of the retreat, to inspire each other to go deeper into um, Baba's knowledge, thinking deeper, thinking out of the box, out of our normal way, normal approaches to Gyan. So um, Stefania and I hope very much you will enjoy this retreat. Um, and we will um, now, I will now introduce our dear sister Wendy. I think many of you know her. Um, Wendy um, came to Baba many, many years ago and she started the first um, retreats, re uh, the first center in Italy, in Rome, um, 1984. And she's born originally in England, um, but we always call her the European, uh, someone with a truly European identity, having lived in many different places, grown up in many different places, and therefore also always brings a very um, different perspective on Baba's wisdom and how to, you know, um, uh, um, use it in different contexts in, in Western communities. Um, Wendy was part of the Olymp Olympic ski team for the Britain, uh, British, um, and it was in 1959 till 1964. And she was also a dancer and choreographer, um, danced in many uh, famous places. So she's a very experienced person, lover of dolphins, and um, worked with them for seven years. Uh, and, and, and um, tra trained them and did art. So, um, yeah, we are very, very happy to have Wendy with us. Her topic is cranking the engine of your mind. And I think we are uh, very, uh, very uh, excited now to hear from, from Wendy. And um, many of you also know her from Casa Samgam, the retreat place in Dubio. <coughs> where she also organized many silence retreats and other retreats with many, for many for, of us. So let's enjoy and um, let's welcome Wendy. So hello, everybody. Good morning. It's uh, really nice to see everybody. I must say this uh, whole idea of um, Zoom and seeing everybody is really very nice. You see them better on the Zoom screen than you do in a hall because you, you know, people can hide in a hall. <laughs> now, churning, I think, has got to be one of the things that I've really enjoyed the most in Gyan. I mean, I think we come into Gyan um, partially through the heart and partially through the head. Um, and we're all sort of on a, on a different percentage on that level. <clears throat> and this will influence the way you churn, of course, obviously. I mean, the people who come in massively from the heart will probably be less stimulated to churn particularly. But the people who come in through the head will enormously want to churn and find the knowledge extremely um, profound and very interesting. And it's like looking at the people that I've seen, the people I've met in the time that I've been in Gyan and the people you come into contact like the daddy junkies and the Jagdish buys and people like that who are, you know, famous for their churning, etc. Uh, you can see that churning permits you to um, see the subtle messages that Baba is giving 
in the Muli, it's there's a lot that he says actually between the lines, and you've probably sort of caught on to this. Um, he remains within a certain structure for the <clears throat> majority of people that need that, and we all need that, so he's, he's clear on that. But then there is more jewels to discover if you want to go down deeper. And it's like with deep sea diving, you've got to take the whole equipment, you know, and the bottles and the oxygen and go down deeper. And you will find things and it's like, you know, you, you add, add up things together about what he says and you'll have two and two make four, but then eventually you'll go down and you'll find four and four make eight. And you, you're picking up on something that is not being obviously expressed. And you won't pick up on it unless you actually do churn, unless you actually do that work. It's probably one of the greatest do-it-yourself tools that he has ever suggested. I mean, um, Muli is really very much like a do-it-yourself book. You know, you've got all the um, instructions there, but when you actually come to doing the thing that you are uh, trying to make, you're actually making it, um, you find that you have to use a certain amount of initiative, you know, at times. And the, the churning of the muli will help you do that. Now, the, the first impression that I got, I must admit, uh, was that our lives have been before Gyan in a certain way with our decisions and our preferences and the things we believed in and the things we did and the things we considered were okay and the things we considered were not okay. Our own little rule book, if you like, and you have a, a drawing of this and then you come into the Muli and you hear what Baba's saying over a space of time and a different pattern emerges to a certain extent. And it's like you take a tracing paper of what he says and you put it on your sanskars on what you see in yourself and you try and see where the lines meet and where the lines don't meet and of course where the lines don't meet because we know that this is god speaking and that god is the truth there's no you can't sort of very well say well who knows if he's right or not it's not a good idea to approach it that way it's very nice to feel and to know and to feel secure enough to know that what he's saying is the truth and so if, if your lines don't co correspond with his lines in your personality and in your way of being, well, then you know there's something that's off. And this is um, an enormous help to what I would say our own self-transformation because you can listen to other people and that will be their way of seeing things. And we're all very different inside. We are different when we came into Gyan, we are different in Gyan, and we will be different at the Golden and Silver Ages, won't we? So um, actually following other people and copying them is not much help. You can only really do it for yourself. So the churning means that this is why the idea of the, the cranking of the car, you know, like in the old days, you know, cars didn't have starters. You had to crank it with a handle and you turned the engine over and cracked it, and then the engine sprung into life, if you know what I mean. And this is what happens when you churn, that your engine springs into life, and you, you're not only listening in a very careful way to see what could apply to you, but you're also uh, seeing what could be the answers of uh, the result of other churnings that you've done and if you churn things, you will find that you will come up with ideas. You will come up with uh, solutions, maybe. Um, and it's interesting to see to what an extent, after a few days, Baba confirms what you have thought in the Muli. And he will do this. And this will give you an immense sense of, of joy, of um, intoxication, actually, uh, because you can see that you're on the right line. Um, he's not said it plainly in the Muli, but you can see that what he's saying is underlining what you're thinking. And this means that there is a, 
a different form of teaching going on. There is a more subtle form of teaching which you can't access if you're only listening to the word. I mean, God has to speak to us physically. He speaks through the word. And of course, you know, uh, most of us don't understand Hindi. So we've got a translation going and possibly even two translations going. So um, the actual precision of the word is probably very different. This morning, for example, we had a, a lovely conversation about the word charity. And there was the Italian who was thinking in one way, then there was Radha, who, of course, is, is from India. And there was myself. And um, I must admit that the idea of charity, when Baba goes on, this is a, an example of churning, when Baba goes on about charity, and then he says, but at the golden age, of course, nobody is needy, so there is no charity. But you are charitable souls of the golden age. Well, what does he mean? And the old Pope, um, Benedict, actually wrote an encyclical that called itself Deus Caritas Est, which means, which is Latin, and means God is love. Now, they translate charity as love. And if you think about, I thought about that, and I thought, I really like that, you know, the idea of charity being something that you give on a body conscious, physical, needy level, okay, but then at the golden age, nobody's needy, so you don't give anything on a physical level, there's no need. But on the other hand, there is always that need for the giving of love, of that goodwill that there will be, and there will be that exchange, and I thought, well, I can go with that. So we will find uh, references, and that is a reference that I found that worked very well for me. And I come from a Christian background, and so there again, you have to look, it's very, very personal. Um, people can inspire you when they churn, but they, they're not you. You can only really do it for yourself and be fully inspired when you do your own uh, churning, grinding, grinding your own ingredients, like Daddy Kumaka once said, you know, you have to grind your own ingredients. And in India, each mother grinds her own ingredients for the, for the curry powder, you know, and they are very much her own ingredients. You don't buy it in a shaker like that, you know, like we have in the West. And she makes her own curry powder, so her curry tastes like nobody else's. Uh, and my churning will taste like nobody else's. It's true. It's meant to do something for me and not maybe something for someone else. So it's good to see exactly what Baba's saying and to look at ourselves. And there is also the, the deep understanding of Gyan itself. Now, what got it me churning? What made me start to churn? Well, um, I went to Rome on the suggestion of Daddy Junkie when I was only about 18 months in Gyan. It, I was very young. I'd never even given the seven days course. Um, and I was very dependent on the explanation that um, the Brahmin teachers in Paris could give me. I mean, I could only sort of partially understand. I remember going to my teacher and saying, you know, give me the Gita because I can't understand what he means, you know all these people, you know, the sannyasi running off into the jungles and all of this, and Krishna's not God, and who thought Krishna was God anyway, because I thought Krishna was a restaurant at the time. Um, you know, that's as, about as far as I got when it came to Hinduism. And so, um, luckily, my teacher said, oh, no, 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 you will soon eventually work this out. Well, that's another form of churning, is working out what God is actually saying to strict Hindus, when you yourself are come from a completely different background and you have to sort of bridge the gap. And I found myself in that position in Rome because, I mean, I had the Vatican two miles away, you know, and they were all extremely Catholic, not only Christian, but very, very Catholic. And their whole approach to God was very different. Their approach to God was very fear-based, which meant that I had to churn what can I say to them that will alleviate this fear that they have of God? Because this is not something that they have in Hinduism. There is no fear there. So we all have to, we all have very good reasons wherever we're living, whatever we're living through. We have got very, very, very good reasons 
to churn. We've got to, because otherwise you will never actually make head or tail of the toolbox that Baba's giving you. And Baba's giving you a, a magnificent toolbox with the Muni, but you've got to go into it quite precisely and quite deeply. And so when we first arrived in Rome, we thought, you know, we'd better start churning or we're not going to survive. Literally, that was, you know, where it was at. We're going to have to find our own answers because there's no one else to ask. And now, of course, we've got internet, we've got Zoom, there's all kinds of things in those days. Our contact with the Brahmin family came from one uh, letter that came from London, which contained the week's Muli in it, and that was about it. Um, so you felt actually quite far away. It was not easy to communicate. And so we started churning, and then we thought, well, how do you start to churn? You know, our intellect's not ready for it. And um, what we started to do was something that was very simple, uh, and that all these students, that the few students that we had around, could participate in. And we just took Baba's list of virtues. We took the list of the virtues and we went down the list of the virtues, one a week, and we churn it and we wrote. And I mean, write. I still write. The writing is very useful because when you churn, you think, and you can have some good ideas, but those good ideas will probably fly out of the window unless you put them down on paper. And you can then take up your ideas and go on with them, where otherwise the mind can get dispersed. And so we churn and we'd write for a week. And we found that these um, churnings that we were doing on the virtues and then on the powers and then on all of God's blessings, because we didn't know how to really extract a point to churn. We didn't really know enough to do so. Um, and so we'd... We'd write it all down, and then the, the churning of the blessings, which came later, you know, like fragrant spiritual roses. What does that mean to you? You know, I mean, you, there's so many things that you can look at, depending on how you feel, depending on what you need. I mean, you can just churn to, as I said, to crank the machine. You need to get the machine running. It's got to start ticking over. Your intellect has got to start involving Gyan within your thought processes, because otherwise you have the danger that your thought processes will go on as usual uh, on whatever it is you're doing, and it could be your work or it could be your family or whatever. And then there's Gyan, but it's totally separate. They're two sort of separate containers. And you don't really want that if you want to transform yourself. You have to put it all into the same bag and take a look at it and understand what your mind is doing and then incorporate your churning into your daily life in other words in what you're actually doing and so we we learned like this and found that the writing down of it and everything that we ever churned in those days we wrote down and we shared it and certain centers even you know copied out what we were sharing via fax in those days, longhand, you know, written out via fax. We, they used to, you know, type them out and give them to their students because it was a good way to help students churn. I mean, patience, for example, I'm just giving you examples. Patience will, everybody understands patience. The first day Brahmin understands patience. So it's easy to start churning that. But patience decidedly takes a turn for the different when you understand what eternity means. If you all of a sudden include the idea of eternity within your patience, it becomes a whole different thing. Patience becomes a very different thing. It's like tolerance. Um, tolerance doesn't have just the one vision of tolerance. Tolerance has at least three visions. The first one where you're grinding your teeth, which is not very funny, and which is our first experience of tolerance, basically. Um, and this is why nobody likes to tolerate, nobody likes to want to tolerate. Um, the whole idea is that the grinding of the teeth is suffering, isn't it? And so nobody likes doing that. But if you learn to 
protect yourself and not be influenced by what you have up till now been tolerating with difficulty, uh, you can actually protect yourself from the difficulty. And of course, you might not be giving too much to the scenario, but if you go beyond that state of detachment into a state of where you can actually give, then you are actually doing what the picture of tolerance tells you, which is the little boy throwing stones at the mango tree, the mango tree dropping the ripe fruit into his hands. And this is where you can, you don't have to, the, the grinding of the teeth has gone. Now, if you don't churn that, you probably won't get beyond that. You'd think, oh, it's a very nice idea. But you really have to get beyond that to be able to appreciate what tolerance is. And tolerance, for example, is, you know, the, the second quality that they said was important for Brahma Baba. And, you know, Brahma Baba was quite something. So, I mean, he uh, tolerated, no doubt. We don't know the ins and outs of what he had to tolerate, but we all have to tolerate. You know, it comes along with the surrender to Baba. There are things you will tolerate. I mean, in the Brahmin family, for example, you can turn that too. Divorce doesn't exist. You know, accept that. These are the souls that you're going to be living with all through the Golden Age and the Silver Age, etc. So, I mean, you can't really avoid that. It's something you have to face. It's not something you really have to turn that much. You have to face it. And then when you face that, the whole idea of tolerance takes another turn and it becomes very different and you realize why you're doing it. And you realize that because of your tolerance, certain things can happen. And that is very, very nice. You suddenly realize when you start practicing things in a certain way after you've turned them, that you suddenly see where Baba's meaning for you to go. Because he doesn't, he leaves you very free, actually, you know. He, I've, this is what I've discovered anyway. So I'm, I'm sort of trying to go down the points that I started looking at. Um, starting churning, you know, just churn on something that intrigues you, something that uh, interests you, something that uh, you, you have to develop an inquisitive nature. Now, an inquisitive nature is not so much a critical nature. It's an understanding. It's a non-devotional nature. A devotional nature will say, OK, you said something. I don't understand what you're saying, but I believe you. Well, that's not what Baba wants. He wants us to develop an inquisitive nature so that we, okay, you've said that. There's a reason for that because you have the truth. What is that reason? I need to discover it. And I need to discover the reason in accordance with my idea of what dharma actually looks like. And it's not only that you see a dharma comes from your deep motivations. I mean, Baba will say, you know, Dharna must be like this and Dharna must be like that. And of course, you can write down the points and it's quite clear. But um, the Dharna is very much due to your own uh, personality and the qualities, the, the divine virtues that you've accumulated at the confluence age. In the world age, it will be like that. And so, you know, how have you gotten there? And so churning sounds at times very intellectual. Now, if you've got an intellectual side to you, an intellectual bent, it's a good idea to allow the intellect to purify by using it and using it in the right way. Uh, and so go to it. You know, it's wonderful. It'll, it'll be very useful for conferences or helping uh, other people that come close to spirituality and understand why spirituality is useful for them. Uh, which they might not understand just through the plain knowledge. They will understand more through your own experiences than, than just by reading a Muli, for example. And so it's not just an intellectual pursuit. It's, it also brings you closer to Baba because Baba's not just a point of light in a picture frame, of course. Um, you have to develop a, a living relationship with him and of course, that's easier said than done because he um, is not here physically. You can't see him. Um, but when you think of other people that you know well, for example, you don't sort of stare into a picture and think about, you know, what their nose looked like or what their hairdo looked like. You think about what they said to you. 
and what reactions they had when you said something to them. And this is more, it's telling you more of what the relationship actually is, is based on and what Baba is actually thinking. You have to bring him alive. It's like the, the page, the Muli page, is something he said, bring that alive, make it become an actual conversation. So the, the churning can be an intellectual pursuit, but it can also be a pursuit of the heart, where you allow Baba to speak to a more um, sensitive part of your nature, because they're things that will emerge through the intellect, and they're things that will emerge through the heart. And you have to leave both channels open. And this is why it's so important to get into the habit of writing and writing all your journeys. Because if you just think, you'll find that they will float out of the window after a little while. And it's interesting to go back on your old notebooks. I've got stacks of them, uh, stacks of your notebooks. Because if, for example, someone asks you to give a talk, um, which probably will, will happen, you know, at some point or another. It's very, very useful to be able to look through those notebooks because you will see that there is a lot of um, good material there that you can actually use in a talk that is quite actually quite locking, so to speak. It's not only in with Brahmins that this is useful. It's surprising how much, I mean, the, the points of tolerance, for example, that I've given you, those three points of tolerance, I mean, Brahmins, they, they know about it anyway, but the looking people, you know, they go, ooh and ah, and I never thought about that. And I said, well, yeah, you see, this is what spirituality can do for you. Uh, it can make you understand things in a better way. Sometimes things that are very unpleasant, like tolerance is not always that pleasant um, by definition, but when you know what to do in the right way, it can be a very, very great power. This is why tolerance is a power too, of course. So um, make sure that you write what it is that you're thinking about, because you can then pursue that thought and keep going with it. And you need to overcome the reticence, which is a certain reticence, but it's just, I would call it laziness, actually. I find I can get very lazy with churning and not really want to churn that much. Um, and I prefer to do something else, which is not so involving. But I find that when I start churning, it's like um, opening up a, um, a child's book, for example. And you, you just can't wait to turn the pages and, and keep going, you know, because it actually then will completely fascinate you. And this is one of the marvels, I'd say, one of the magics that, Bra that Baba does with us because the moment we do because of course when you're churning Baba's mulis and things and the points in the muli you are connecting with him so there is something happening that will create enthusiasm and this is um, a splendid way because you will realize how light and happy you become when you are actually churning it's it creates a lot of enthusiasm it's sort of like someone taking you out into the yard and showing you a, a muddy puddle you know, and the person saying to you, in that muddy puddle, there are lots of stones, but there are also lots of diamonds, go find them. And of course, it all looks the same muddy thing, doesn't it? But when you start looking at it and washing off each stone, you suddenly realize that there are diamonds there, and you can't wait to clean out the whole puddle. And this is, we're all like that. We're all a little bit like puddles with, with lots of diamonds inside, and we need to find them. We need to find where we can actually grow with this. It's all um, very much for us. I mean, we don't churn for other people unless we know that something is going to be useful for them. But it's basically useful for us, and it's what is developing us as people. And um, of course, like, you know, take this almost anything you could take. I remember right in the beginning, one of the, one of the days that we had, we chose purity. Well, I mean, purity. I had no idea what Baba meant by purity. No idea. The only thing that came to my mind was bottled mineral water. And, you know, the mineral water gets filtered through the different layers, the different stratas of the sand or the whatever, the earth, and it comes out, it's filtered, and it's pure. Yeah, I could get that far. And 
of course, this is what happens. Baba filters everything that we are actually. Then we come out pure at the golden age. And along the way, we have discovered what it is that we need to develop and what it is that we need to discard. And we have come out pure with all of the things that we have developed in their perfect state, in their pure state. And this is the golden age state. So there I understood, I started to understand what purity really meant. And it took us two Sundays. We used to do this on Sunday. It took us two Sundays of churning all week and talking about what we'd churned because we'd read our churnings to each other. It was only two of us to start with. And spending an hour at least an hour or two in a batty to work out what it really felt like spiritually purity and we we one one week one weekend was not enough for example you will find a depth of knowledge that you never sort of imagined and one of the possibly you know the main objectives of um churning is when you come into relationships, of course, within the family or within your lucky family. Uh, and that is where you need to check your power of tolerance. That's where you will start checking it immediately because there will be situations, there will be problems, you know. Um, churning is not just repeating what Baba says. Of course, obviously that's not what's churning. It means what is it in that that he's saying that is relevant to me? And what is it that I believe in? What is it that I believed in before Gyan? And what is it that I believe in now still in Gyan? And what I believe in, is that true? Uh, um, very probably we didn't believe much in the idea of the soul and, and the eternity of the soul. We might not have believed in that, we do now. What, did we, what other things did we believe in? Uh, we've all got belief systems, and are they accurate? Are they right in accordance with what Baba is teaching us? So, churning will permit you to go through these things piece by piece. It's very personal, piece by piece, to see what is relevant in your life. There's, like I was saying, at times, if you're an instrument, if you're a teacher, you have to consider what the people in your city or your country think. You may come from somewhere else, which is my case, and you may think differently, but they think in a, another way, and you have to realize how you can help them, you know. Um, now, you will find that um, Baba is, when, I mean, this is something I never expected, but Baba cooperates a lot in a very subtle way uh, with your churning, because he will let you know he will let you know if what you're turning and what you're thinking and what you're building in your mind is true or whether it's you're off at a tangent and it's not accurate. He will let you know somehow. You will have a feeling of doubt and then it's good to stop and wait for other moolies because you will see that he will feed in and you will find that the doubt will possibly dissolve and then you will realize that you were onto something something that he hasn't openly stated in the Muli. I mean, you see these sort of things when you um, listen to um, people like Jagdish, for example, or even Daddy Jank. I mean, these were people who used to seriously have um, a, a subtle dialogue and we're, we're getting, I would say, um, private tuition almost from Baba, but you can get private tuition from Baba. You've got to do it subtly. He's not going to give private tuition in the Muli. Uh, the Muli is for everybody, but the private tuition will come when you start actually churning about it. And your thoughts are, are climbing the stairs, they're climbing the ladder that are going to take you to what he really wants you to understand. And I can see, you know, how very differently our minds function and, and it will take us to a, a different place, where, which is what we're, which is what is destined, you know. And so, you know, coming back to, um, the relationships that I was saying went wrong, um, that is another enormous area of, of the, the journey, which um, is one of the things that you have to 
look at the most because you're transforming your character. Now, a lot of the time when relationships go wrong, the first thing to do is to say to yourself with lots of detachment, but lots of goodwill and love, did I really do anything wrong? Did I do, do, do I have a wrong vision? Is there anything that, any mistake I made? And you have to see to what an extent you could have created the situation that is happening. On the other hand, very often, you also have to not take it personally because very often people are reacting to something that happened to them years ago. And these are what you'd call the deep rooted sanskars. I mean, one might have wondered what deep rooted sanskars are like, you know, what they are. Well, I mean, forgetting regularly uh, because you just forget or because you might be slightly lazy or you're running late or whatever, forgetting to wash your, um, your saucepan. <laughs> when you live in a barn, you know what that means. Um, you, you find the saucepan full of tea leaves and all that kind of thing and milk, you know, someone's made milk and milk tea in that. And the, the saucepan is always left for someone else to wash. And it could be something else too. You know, anybody who's lived in a baban will know what I'm talking about. Um, now, that is not a deep-rooted sanskar, forgetting to wash your cup or whatever. I used to go around Gubbio. This is, a, I mean, these are fun things to talk about. I used to go around Gubbio picking up the cups. And I knew exactly whose cup it was because I knew where they'd left it. So now this is not a deep-rooted sanskar. This is just... Um, negligence of sorts, you know what I mean? You, and you've just forgotten, it's not a problem. Um, but on the other hand, a deep-rooted sanskar are those sanskars that you have created as defense mechanisms. Now, this is a whole cauldron here. Um, anybody who has lived through the, in their lives, and now when we look at the world, we know that over something like over 90% of families are dysfunctional. There's some form of a problem within the relationships in the family. And the relationships can go on as long as certain things are stated in certain ways and certain people accept certain roles that are possibly not theirs. The dysfunctional family is quite a complicated thing. Now, anybody who has been into um, being in a dysfunctional family or experienced abuse or bullying as a child or um, abandonment of any form. Um, these are big uh, experiences of pain that you have, which will make you develop what I call coping mechanisms. And these coping mechanisms are sanskars. And these come up all the time. We use them all the time because we've not yet managed to decontaminate them, if you like. So we're still working underneath these um, old, old visions of defense, how you have to defend yourself, maybe. And your form of defense might simply be aggression. You aggress the other person. And this is why I said, you know, these, a lot of the relationships that are happening can be due to these sort of things, especially if you live within, closely within family, with the Brahmin family, but it'll happen very clearly when you're on the outside, of course, obviously. And there, it, these are the deep-rooted sanskars which have to be removed. Now, those being, getting them dug up is quite, quite different. It's quite difficult because um, they are actually not your negativity is you defending yourself from negativity that happened to you. In other words, where you were young, maybe, or you were a victim, and this has made you um, doubtful or um, untrusting, or it's made you lack self-respect. And these are the deep-rooted sanskars that churning, and when you churn, coming very close to Bala will help you. Um, because there is no other way. I mean, you have to, when you're going to become um, perfect, if you're going to come to the golden age, you're going to be perfect and pure. Um, you can't have these old things hanging around. And when you purify, they will disappear anyway. But it is very good to avoid, in the meantime, the negativity that your reaction can produce. 
because very often when people have negative reactions, it's good to sort of think, oh, you know, first of all, did I do anything that, I, that could have avoided that? But on the other hand, you know, it may not be me. It may be something that they have went through years ago and that this is their natural response to it. And we all have this. I mean, most, I mean, I naturally coming from a Christian background and having been brought up in a convent, you know, a Catholic convent, um, when people told me in Gyan, you know, this is God speaking, um, I sat back very quietly and I thought, well, yeah, you know, okay, um, I'll go along with what you're saying, um, but I want to see about that. The, the approach was doubtful, but I wanted to see. I really wanted to see what God was going to do, what he did, what he said, how he behaved. And um, I remember through the first months, and this was my first churning, if you like, of getting over my doubtful mechanism, which was a mechanism to protect my innocence. You know, I had to learn to doubt because otherwise I could have been taken in by heavens knows what. Um, I would doubt. And going through it, I, it's not that I put Baba through it, but I thought, you know, who would ever come out with this sort of stuff? What benefit is there possibly in it for him? And that is one of the things that convinced me, but I had to think about it. I had to churn it. Now that's my first, my very, very first churning really, that happened spontaneously, but it happened because of one of my defense mechanisms. And we all have that because we've all been devotees and we've all seen our devotion not function, not work for us. And so we've had to back away and try and look, in some, look for something else that we could believe in and then possibly only to a limited extent, um, believing wholeheartedly in what Baba actually is telling you, which is the truth, is a life-changing experience. It really is. Um, it, will, it, it changes you very, very deeply because the whole nature of human, humanity at the moment is total um, doubt, total uh, question as to where are we going? What is happening? I mean, even more so since the COVID lockdown and all of this. I mean, people just can't see where we're going. And I'm seeing that one of the things that is important for people is that they see our stability. It gives them something to stand on when the water gets deep. They can feel that they can stand on this solidity of what we believe in. And although they don't quite understand it, it's something for them to stand on for the moment and catch their breath. That's very important, actually. So um, really, churning deeply will help you, um, should I say, understand all of this. So churning will help Baba um, see, let you see these sorts of things. You don't want to go off at your own angle and develop your own intellect and do your own thing, you always want to check back. Is what I'm seeing right? Is what I'm thinking right? Is it in accordance with Baba's Muli? Is it right? Yes. And then you go on step by step by step. And it's um, a wonderful um, discovery, actually. Wendy? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry to stop you. It was no, no, really, a, you are uh, like a fountain of I feel like listening to it, you know, the whole thing again, straight after the class, because so many points have emerged. But we have lots of questions coming up. Well, that's good. Get, Is get there it. anything you want to mention before we go into the Q&A or, or shall we no, uh, that's, dive into that? That's fine. I've said most of the things that I intended on seeing. Yeah. You know, just that we have to realize what we did really believe in. You know what I mean? That I said that. I need to yeah. sort of <laughs> Even the point is said now, you know, that be believing wholeheartedly what Baba is telling me is true, is life-changing. That's such a, so powerful. I just, 
felt like asking myself, do I really believe it wholeheartedly or is it like, you know, it's something to check. Yeah. And so many checking points. But if I can just ask you a few of the questions that have, that have come up. Uh, one of the questions was, how do I know that I'm thinking out of my comfort zone or normal familiar way of thinking? Or if I'm, you know, I think for many of us, for you, it may be natural. I don't know, you've probably always been like this, like out of the comfort zone type of a person. But I think for many of us, we want to go out of the comfort zone. We really want to explore new you know, points and aspects of things. And then we sit down with a point and we want to churn it. And we may not know, you know, how do I get out of my own box? Do you have any? Um, I'm, you know, I think it's uh, just to be inquisitive and be intrigued by things. What is inquisitive? Is it? Inquisitive, you know, inquiry. Yeah, like asking questions. People say it like that. Um, be inquisitive. You know, be um, interested in things. If you have an, a nature that is intrigued, is interesting, who likes learning, who are seekers after knowledge, people who are interested in, in different ideas, um, that will help you enormously. I mean, most Brahmins, I say, are like that because otherwise they'd have never accepted Gyan. I mean, Gyan is very different to what everybody else is saying, you know. And if you didn't have some form of an interest in different things, well, you would have never taken it on. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, you see, churning is aimed at you discovering something that maybe is quite uncomfortable because it's aimed at you transforming, you know. So accept the fact that it might be uncomfortable and then work out how you can transform comfortably, how you can work this out in a comfortable way. And if you were to sit down with a point that you want to, that you are interested in, you want to go into the depth and even, you know, you would like it. Like I can say for myself, I would love to be uncomfortable with things. I would, I would love to get to that place. But what kind of questions would you ask yourself? Like what kind of, how would you start journeying? What would you do? Well, I, mean, I, I asked myself what it was that I really believed in. Um, and what, what did I believe that God possibly did? Because I believed in God. Okay, that I didn't have to do that sort of journey, but uh, I believed him about him. I believed him of him in a very vague way, which is the only thing that I had been given by the religious background that I knew that was not very deep anyway um, from my family, you know. And so I thought, what is it that you would expect of God? What do you believe around him and about him? And then I realized that um, I wasn't quite sure. I had to work it out. And um, one is influenced by the things that people say to you, the things. I mean, I could see the way the nuns used to talk and the way they thought. But I could see that it was that although they said a loving God, I never could see the experience of love in what they were doing and what they were saying. They were trying their best, but it didn't hit the spot. It was very disciplined, very, very orderly, you know, and I didn't feel that God would be that way. I thought he would be more flexible, more um, creative with things and accept differences as long as the differences were not evil, if you see what I mean. So you, you, each one has their own way of going into a journey. I mean, you know, you, you get stimulated by different things. I wonder, Wendy, there is some strange sound going on. Is there, any, is there anything in your background? Is there anything happening? There is, they're doing work in the apartment above my head and there's not much I can uh, do. Ah, okay, no problem. And we just know that, no problem. With any luck, if you've got good yoga, it'll stop. <laughs> it's it's, ab it's absolutely fine. <laughs> can I ask you a next question? Uh, here is one question. Sometimes during meditation time, I start churning on some Baba's points. Is this okay or should I stop and just focus on the meditation? Is it okay to mix the meditation and churning or is it like separate? Well, churning is actually separate to meditation, but if you, you feel that there is this urge to meditate, well, grab a piece of paper and write down what you've started on 
and then go back to Baba and meditate and see if he continues to stimulate you because some of the most stimulated churning is when he's almost sounds like he's talking directly to you. Now that, of course, you don't want to really stop because uh, there is a, sometimes a fine line between meditation and actually realization, which is what churning can be. You can have a, a series of realizations like that, uh, but that's not always churning, you know, and so you don't want to stop it, you know, but if by going back, if you write it down and then go back to Baba and see, you know, is, is, you know let me know if you want me to continue with, it, with this and leave it very flexible for yourself. I mean, don't be rigid about it's got to be this and it's got to be that. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Wendy says that there should not be a container for the thinking of daily life and the container for the churning of Gyan. For self-transformation, self there has to be one container only. Can you please elaborate on how to make this one, how to integrate? Well, I remember a, a very interesting class that Brian Bacon um, was giving in Oxford years ago. And there was a question by a brother saying, well, you know, my logic life is like this and like this and like this, but how do I do that? And I remember Brian saying to him, you've only got one life. It's that, you've got one life. And of course he's right, you do, you have only one life. Although we talk about our logic life because we go to work, and, but it's still us as souls in this body going to work. You see, so you've, you've got to somehow make space for everything within Baba's logic uh, in one thing. Otherwise, you're disintegrated. You're not integrated. You need to integrate yourself. You can't um, have a, du a dual life. You can't live a double life, you see. So it's got to be integrated somehow. And that, again, is, is a bit of work, you know. Because it's easier if you keep it in two separate containers. You know, you're the perfect Brahmin and you're all white and all this kind of thing when you come to the center. And then when you get out of the center, you jump into the car and change into your jeans and then God knows what you do. That's living a dual life. That's not possible. <laughs> Great. Um, here is one who is asking. Um, there are actually two who are asking similar questions about how do I know if I'm off track? How do I know if Manamat is being mixed with, you know, what Baba is teaching me? Um, mostly, uh, whatever it is that you will be churning and is on track will not have a personal benefit in it, except just to make you more powerful and more pure. Uh, the moment, uh, I mean, you, you have to be very careful about this, it's true. The question is quite justified because very often you will um, be very careful about those areas or those situations or those people in your life who you are dependent on or you have an, an, an attachment to or you prefer. And you'll find that your churning goes around these things but doesn't go through them. And the moment you start seeing that you are in a protectionist attitude, you need to stop and think. Because within churning, when Baba is teaching you, and I think of this very often, you know, is that the churning and the meditation very much go together. Um, there will be no benefit for the self or any protectionism for anybody else. It'll just be Baba and the world, literally world service or what is good for everybody. Yeah. That's a very powerful reference. Um, I liked what you said, you mentioned two points. You said, you know, when you churn, you ask yourself, what is irrelevant for me? And then what is it that I believe in based on like my old belief systems? I wonder if this is like a method that we could use today even, or maybe you want to, you know, maybe you could take an example of like, you know, a point from the Murli or something, point of knowledge that you would take that feels like relevant to you. And how can you check your old belief systems? And um, I'll give you an, an example that is 
oft relevant in the Muli, that Baba speaks about in the Muli, is the role of women. Now we know that he's coming from um, an Indian background. Uh, and we are lucky enough in many ways in Europe, especially in the, in the West. I mean, we don't have that situation where that he often describes, we don't. But what is my vision of being a woman, for example? Like, what is my position of being a man? How was I treated as a child? Uh, if I was a little girl or if I was a little boy, you know. Uh, and, and this will give you um, an idea of uh, what your position, what your belief is, because it's what happened to you. So that's what yours is, um, let alone just the culture. So it, this will teach you a lot about, you know, what your positioning is. And this is how you will discover it. I mean, for example, for me, my mother absolutely rejected me on a emotional level, not on a physical level, on an emotional level, because I was not the little boy she wanted. Now, that is a, was an enormous discovery that I discovered, whoa, you know, about a month before Gyan, there was a reason for that, that I literally discovered what it actually had meant. And that how I had, again, coping mechanisms, I had all my young childhood tried to convince my mother that I was a boy or that I was better than a boy. And I mean, anybody who knows Santa Claus can see exactly what that is meaning to me right now. You know, and, and so these things will remain. Some of them are negative. But some of them are just just the way you are then, you know what I mean? But of course, it, it made me have to fight for my rights. Now, what is each one of ours positioning? We all have a personal position in this. So that is just one very big one because it's got to do with what's going on in the society around you. Maybe what's going on at your workplace and how they see you as an employee compared to the boys or the men that are being employed and how you are feeling on the inside about your being a woman. And then, of course, you've got to get out of all of that to see what it means to be a soul and not a woman. And coming back on yesterday with Didi Manmohini, Didi Manmohini was a surprising um, mixture where if you were looking at her and she was not speaking to you, her vibration was very masculine. It really was. There were, there were some photographs of Didi which would make you think she was a man, but she was extremely, in, at other times, she could be extremely fun and extremely sweet. So she had found the balance. We need to find a balance. We've got to become Vishnu, which is not, it's not easy, you know what I mean? And of course, all of this is what it takes. I mean, it's fascinating, actually. So that's just one of the things that Baba says, yeah. which is every one of us, every one of us in one way or another. It's very inspiring and it makes turning so relevant, if you put it this way. It's really, you know. It's the only way you've got to think about it. Yeah. And it's you, you've got to think about. Yes. It's you, because whatever it is you experienced and you've worked out, you can help someone else that had that kind of an experience. You can help. Mm. Mm. I think we can all, we have all, all lots of things to take with us into the day. I think, especially this about the checking our belief systems. Mm. And like you were saying, how much do I wholeheartedly be, believe what Baba is telling me? And like you were saying, that's life changing. And We've all done it up to a certain extent, but I'm, I'm sure there is a, a lot of margin there for uh, going more into the depth. So, and, and I mean, so many points. This meeting was being recorded. Uh, we were having some technical problems, but we will send the recording to all participants. So you can tell all your friends who were not able to join the meeting that they will get a recording and we will fix it before tomorrow. But thank you so much, Swanti. Is there anything you want to add before we go into the meditation? <laughs> Maybe we can just announce that we may send out another Zoom link. Okay. Okay. We thought that this one had 300 availability, but it turned out to be 100. So we have to fix that one. 
So please check your email, emails. And if you have, haven't registered, uh, please do so. So we, we can keep you updated. But anyway, this was recorded. So you will all get the recording. And like I said, I feel like watching this one again <laughs> today because there were so many points. It was like a fountain of, of jewels. But then, as we said, this retreat is really to go into the, then, you know, to sit with ourselves. That's why we chose to have the session short and to give more time for personal reflection during the day. So I think that if, if there isn't anything else, Wendy, um, if you could guide us into a meditation yeah. and the noise has just stopped. It's perfect for the meditation. Okay. I sit quietly with Baba. And I wonder, what will he reveal to me today? And it's funny to think that I have lived with me all this life. And yet he is the one revealing me to me. He knows me better than I do. And he also knows the way I can come out of my shady areas, my difficulties. What effect does Baba's knowledge have on me? I just ask myself as I meditate. And I get the image of a very chaotic room. very disorderly, very messy. And I can see Baba quietly reorganizing that inner space. Helping me see what is not relevant anymore. I trust him because he has no reason to do anything that would not be perfect for me. There is no competition, no challenge there. It is his act of creation. He does this for each one. And I see him quietly making order and putting things in their right place. And I watch. I know this is the perfect way. I just have to make sure that I see and remember. Remembering what he does is easier than just taking orders. I don't like orders. But help is wonderful.
And so I use this meditation to feel peace within myself and to feel closer to him. Om Shanti. Om Shanti, big thanks to you, Wendy. This was absolutely wonderful. And I'm seeing in the chat also that everyone has enjoyed it a lot. So thank you so much. And for all the participants, and you are welcome to join as well, Wendy, of course, if you want to. We will be meeting again at 5 o'clock Central European time for the small group conversations. And it would be very useful if we could explore and experiment with the points that Wendy has mentioned today. And then we meet again at 5 o'clock Central European time for small groups. Yeah, I mean, I can suggest some of the things if they want to take up. I mean, there's so much that you can churn for you. It's up to you. But you can <clears throat> use Baba in all the different relationships, for example, if that's something that you would feel like. What, is, what does Baba as a father mean? But then that would be a perfect father. What would it mean to be the child of a perfect father? But then in future lives, what would it mean for you to be the perfect father. We have to learn that too. So that's a thought. That's something, if somebody has not inspiration for turning, that's a thought. Or else, um, you know, at the golden age, there are, no, there are no moodies in the morning and there are no seniors to tell you what to do. And there's no Srimat anyway. What is it that you've got left? The only thing you've got left, if you think about it, is the, the, deep divine virtues that you have taken in while you've been at the confluence age and it's your love it's your um goodwill it's your sweetness that will dictate to you that will whistle in your ear what you have to do and so there's no obedience there there is no you know obeying someone so you can think about that too. What is it that you're taking to the golden age? So there's many, many choices. Wonderful, to... wonderful. <laughs> it's up to you. Yes, thank you so much. And see you soon. Enjoy the day. And small groups today. And then tomorrow morning, same time, we will have Jim Ryan with us for the next um, session, our next spiritual resource. So... Om Shanti, everyone, and see you today, later today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Om Shanti, everyone.